So in an unusual turn for a Saturday papal document upload, I have a two documents this weekend. Both are fairly short, and the second one is actually really short. The second one can be considered as just fighting words from Pope Pius X, and I think you might find them enjoyable. They're very, very, very relevant to our times today. But first, I have Praestantia Scriptura on the Bible Against the Modernists by Pope Pius X, promulgated in 1907. Modu proprio of our Most Holy Lord Pius X by Divine Providence Pope on the decisions of the Pontifical Commission on the Bible and on the censures and penalties against those who neglect to observe the prescriptions against the errors of the modernists. In his encyclical letter, Providentissimus Deus, given on November 18, 1893, our predecessor, Leo XIII, of immortal memory, after describing the dignity of sacred scripture and commending the study of it, set forth the laws which govern the proper study of the Holy Bible, and having proclaimed the divinity of these books against the errors and calumnies of the rationalists, he at the same time defended them against the false teachings of what is known as the higher criticism, which, as the pontiff most wisely wrote, are clearly nothing but the commentaries of rationalism derived from a misuse of philology and kindred studies. Our predecessor, too, seeing that the danger was constantly on the increase and wishing to prevent the propagation of rash and erroneous views, by his apostolic letters, Vigilante Studici Memorars, given on October 30th, 1902, established a pontifical council or commission on biblical matters, composed of several cardinals of the Holy Roman Church, distinguished for their learning and wisdom, to which commission were added as consultors a number of men in sacred orders, chosen from among the learned in theology and in the Holy Bible, of various nationalities and differing in their methods and views concerning exegetical studies. In so doing, the pontiff had in mind, as an advantage most adapted, for the promotion of study and for the time in which we live, that in this commission there should be the fullest freedom for proposing, examining, and judging all opinions whatsoever, and that the cardinals of the commission were not, read, were not to reach any definite decision, as prescribed in the said apostolic letters, before they had examined the arguments in favor and against the question to be decided, omitting nothing which might serve to show in the clearest light the true and genuine state of the biblical questions under discussion. Only after all this had been done were the decisions reached to be submitted for the approval of the Supreme Pontiff and then promulgated. After mature examination and the most diligent deliberations, the Pontifical Biblical Commission has happily given certain decisions of a very useful kind for the proper promotion and direction on safe lines of biblical studies. But we observe that some persons, unduly prone to opinions and methods tainted by pernicious novelties and excessively devoted to the principles of false liberty, which is really immoderate license and in sacred studies, proves itself to be a most insidious and a fruitful source of the worst evils against the purity of the faith, have not received and do not receive these decisions with the proper obedience. Wherefore, we find it necessary to declare and to expressly prescribe, and by this our act we do declare and decree that all are bound in conscience to submit to the decisions of the biblical commission relating to doctrine, which have been given in the past and which shall be given in the future, in the same way as to the decrees of the Roman congregations approved by the pontiff. Nor can all those escape the note of disobedience or temerity, and consequently of grave sin, who in speech or writing contradict such decisions, and this besides the scandal they give and the other reasons for which they may be responsible before God for other temerities and errors which generally go with such contradictions. Moreover, in order to check the daily increasing audacity of, of many modernists who are endeavoring by all kinds of sophistry and devices to detract from the force and efficacy not only of the decree Lamentabile Sane Exudi, the so-called syllabus of errors, issued by our order by the Holy Roman and Universal Inquisition on July 3rd of the present year, but also of our encyclical letters, Pascendi Dominici Gregis, given on September 8th of this same year, we do by our apostolic authority repeat and confirm both at the decree of the Supreme Congregation and those encyclical letters of ours, adding the penalty of excommunication against our contra contradictors. And this we declare and decree that should anybody which many, may God forbid, be so rash as to defend any one of the propositions, opinions, or teachings condemned in these documents, he falls ipso facto under the censure contained under the chapter Docentes of the Constitution Apostolicae Sedis, which is the first among the excommunications Latia Sentatia, simply reserved to the Roman pontiff. This excommunication is to be understood as salivis poenis, which may be incurred by those who have violated in any way the said documents, as propagators and defenders of heresies, 
and their propositions, opinions, and teachings are heretical, as has happened more than once in the case of the adversaries of both of these documents, especially when they advocate the errors of the modernists, that is, the synthesis of all heresies. Wherefore, we again and most earnestly exhort the ordinaries of the dioceses and the heads of religious congregations to use the utmost vigilance over teachers, first of all in the seminaries, and should they find any of them imbued with the errors of the modernists and eager for what is new and noxious, or lacking in docility to the prescriptions of the Holy See, in whatsoever way published, let them absolutely forbid the teaching office to such. So too, let them exclude from sacred orders those young men who give the very faintest reason for doubt that they favor condemned doctrines and pernicious novelties. We exhort them also to take diligent care to put an end to those books and other writings, now growing and exceedingly numerous, which contain opinions or tendencies of the kind condemned in the encyclical letters and decree above mentioned. Let them see to it that these publications are removed from Catholic publishing houses, and especially from the hands of students and the clergy. By doing this, they will at the same time be promoting real and solid education, which should always be a subject of the greatest solicitude for those who exercise sacred authority. All these things we will, in order to be sanctioned and established by our apostolic authority, ought to the contrary notwithstanding. Given at Rome in St. Peter's, the 18th November, 1907, the fifth year of our pontificate. Pope Pius X. The second document you could call it today is um, an excerpt from a address he gave to bishops and, cardin uh, bishops and cardinals of the Church on the 50th anniversary of the Proclamation of the Dogma of the Immaculate Conception. It was given in 1904 by Pope Pius X. It is notable that when receiving the bishops and audience on this solemn occasion, the Holy Father thought it well to emphasize only two points in the course of a brief allocation. The times are becoming difficult and distressing for the Catholic Church, but let us not be troubled. On earth the Church is militant. It is for us to be the captains who lead the armies into battle. Have we not the certainty of victory as powerful incentive? Always before our eyes and the, are these divine words. I have not come to send peace with the sword. If they have persecuted me, they will persecute you. But have confidence, I have overcome the world. If we know how to make ourselves the light of the world by our teaching and the salt of the earth by our example, to put it in a word, we employ the resources of virtue and doctrine that Paul enjoined on his own disciples, Titus and Timothy, namely, the sanctity and perfection of life, strength and teaching, the spirit of sacrifice and self-denial, active and enlightened zeal, charity that is at once strong and gentle, then we will win the love and veneration of the good, yea, and the esteem and respect even of our enemies. The task which lies before us is difficult. Let us find our support and strength in the loving providence of him who, when he sent his own apostles into the world as lambs among wolves, reassured them and encouraged them to have no fear, being confident that he would always be at their side. Behold, I am with you all days, even to the consummation of the world. On the other hand, when we measure our own meeker strength against the difficulty of the task, we will always be brought to the realization that we are but worthless instruments in the hands of the Lord, and we will have recourse to him in our trying needs. He will hear our prayers and enable us to say, I can do all things in him who strengthens me. Venerable brethren, there is only one piece of advice that I offer to you. Watch over your seminaries and over candidates for the priesthood. As you yourselves know, an air of independence which is fatal for souls is widely diffused in the world, and has found its way even within the sanctuary. It shows itself not only in the relation to authority, but also in regard to doctrine. Because of it, some of our young clerics, animated by that spirit of unbridled criticism which holds sway at the present day, have come to lose all respect for the learning which comes from our great teachers, the fathers and doctors of the church, the interpreters of revealed doctrine. If ever you have in your seminary one of these new style savants, get rid of him without delay. On no account impose hands upon him. You will always regret having ordained even one such person. Never will you regret having excluded him. Thank you for listening. I'm Anthony Stein. Pray for the church.